Didute, Kate Mila Falcha. Welcome to Irish Granny Tarot. It's Saturday. I'm all ready to do our book. And I am just going to get right into it. This is a little more lighthearted, although ironically enough, it ties in with the larger picture. Doesn't everything. And I don't have questions formulated in my head. I may create them as we go along. I hope you'll comment and send me questions if you have them. Now, I found out about this book uh, when Greg Oliar interviewed the author. And she was so funny. And the story was so engaging. And I thought, this is what we need. Something a little bit on the lighter side. Let me tell you a little bit about the book. This is The Truth About Lies by Asia Radin. And I was fascinated. She studied ancient history and physics at the University of Chicago and worked as the head of the auction division at the House of Khan, which this says is famous, so I'll take their word for it. <laughs> she was a senior designer for a Los Angeles-based fine jewelry company, Takori. She's an experienced jeweler, a trained scientist, and a well-read historian. She lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is the author of some other books, one of which I also have but have not yet read, Stoned. Now, if she lived anywhere near where I live, this would be an, about an entirely different subject, although the color is appropriate. <laughs> That's as much as I'll say. This book is about the difference between truth, a fact, a lie, why we tell lies, how we can be deceived by them, and how the brain and psychology, both neurology and psychology, uh, tie into this. And it's about nine of the most famous cons in the world. I thought this would be fun. so. Um, I did not go back and rewrite my notes. So if I stumble a little because I can't read my writing or I need to give it a moment of thought to organize my hieroglyphics here, I hope you'll understand. So The Truth About Lies, written in 2021, and the introduction is called The Currency of Living. And she starts out by saying, we always wonder why we believe a lie. How, you know, how could we be so dumb? How could we believe that lie? But the real question is, why do you believe the truth? And she said, often fact doesn't sound any different from a lie. And this book is about why we lie, why we believe what we hear. And she says, there are only so many ways to lie and there are nine basic cons. These are, these are, with specific examples, they're nine generic forms of the con in this book. So this book talks about truth versus lies, belief versus faith, deception versus propaganda. We blindly trust some facts. For example, the earth is round. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that the earth is round? Uh, how do you know that you haven't been lied to? Well, when you're presented with some facts, we have what is called by psychologists and neurologists, uh, the honesty bias. We tend to take things on face value. If somebody tells you something uh, is a fact, it's more likely statistically that you're going to believe them. Unless, of course, you know this person is an inveterate liar or it's Donald Trump. But other than that, if somebody tells you something, you're more likely to believe them than not. And this is a, an evolutionary uh, protective mechanism. We need to be able to make use of the benefit of the knowledge of people who've come before us from their experiences and their perceptions. That's how children learn. That's how the human race continues to uh, move along. And it's the knowledge of the collective. And we have to be able to take some things as accepted truth. So that was the introduction. And then she starts with part one, lies that we tell each other. So the next couple of things are going to be the kind of lies that we uh, sort of go along with. 
and uh, the chapter is Perception, Persuasion, and the Evolution of Deceit. So, the hard truth, this is a fact, not just the truth, and there's a difference. We all lie some of the time. Uh, it's sim similar in an evolutionary sense to camouflage in animals. It can be a protective mechanism. All species lie. And she gave some examples. For example, the Cryptostylis orchid, which smells like uh, the orchid dupe wasp. And the wasp is fooled and is attracted. Then there's the snake mimic hawk moth. <laughs> These names. Uh, the caterpillar of this moth has a pattern like a snake. And the idea is that it fools birds that would ordinarily want to eat it. They think it's a snake and they avoid it and then it gets to become a moth. So it's a protective camouflage. Trickery is fundamental to communication and to interaction in all species, including humans. There's a theory that language was developed in order to manipulate that our most prized possession, language, not only strengthens our ability to lie, but it greatly extends its range. It uh, can be with written words. Uh, we can rewrite the facts. We can rewrite the past, the present, or the future. So the next time you start speaking, just realize that uh, the ability to speak may have been developed in order to lie. Speech allows deception to, to, to transcend space and time. And uh, the very first earliest developmental milestones that they track in babies is the ability to lie. That uh, when a child is able to start being deceptive, that means they're appropriately developing. And if by a certain age they're incapable of doing that, they worry that there's something wrong with the child. Uh, the first uh, three chapters of this section explore the mechanisms of deceit with uh, three of the world's oldest cons, the big lie. Now, unfortunately, as with many tools of propaganda, uh, active measures of the Russians, for example, terminology is often misappropriated and repeated and repeated uh, in order to change perception. So the term, the big lie, meant something different until Trump started using it the way he's using it. Uh, we'll talk about what it used to mean and what it means in the context of this book. Then the other con is the shell game. And the third is the old bait and switch. So the big lie, this exploits our tendency to believe that a lie could not be a lie if it's so outrageously huge. To disbelieve it would threaten our collective sense of objective reality. If you tell a lie that's just so huge, that just sounds crazy, people are more inclined to believe it. The shell game exploits flaws in our perceptual cognition. It's got more to do with uh, eye and brain coordination. And the bait and switch is when real evidence is misrepresented and it gets uh, the mark is the victim of the con. It gets the mark to believe whatever you want the mark to believe. So deception itself is an evolutionary tool and it can save our lives and has in the past and can get you out of some, <laughs> some it can save your ass too. <laughs> so. These first three cons show the how and the why that a lie works so, and how do you tell a lie. So the oldest trick in the book, credulity, duplicity, and how to tell a really big lie. Let's see here. What did I think I should? Oh, she starts every chapter with quotations from famous people and some of them are just marvelous, but. I have to leave you something to read, uh, but I just had to repeat this. And this is from Douglas Adams, who I believe wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I, I didn't like it, sorry, but I think, I think that's who he is. The impossible often has a kind of integrity 
which the merely improbable lacks. And then from our old friend, the great mass of people will more easily fall victims to a big lie than to a small one. Adolf Hitler. The big lie is making an outrageously unbelievable claim with total confidence. And it's more likely that you will be able to convince people that you own an island than that you bought a boat. So how she explains it is, if you say to a friend of yours, I just bought a yacht. They're going to go, oh, all right, if they know you well enough and provided you know I'm not speaking to billionaires right now and I kind of doubt that I am, you claim that you just out of the blue bought a yacht, people are going to raise a few eyebrows. But if you tell them that you bought an island, it's more likely that they will believe you. Why? Because people cannot comprehend that anyone would make up something so outrageous. It works with our belief in the truth and uh, people rely on a shared objective reality. They just can't imagine that you would go beyond the bounds of that reality. The simplest swindle is to tell a gigantic whopper and stick to it. People cannot believe a normal, reasonable person would just brazenly lie. While we move through this book, I want you to keep in mind current political events and see where these things apply. Uh, the story may be unbelievable, but the even more unbelievable you make your lie, the much more likely it is that people will believe it. There is power in audacity. And we have a belief in objective reality. Things fall down, gravity. Time moves forward, the linear nature of our perception of time. Uh, somebody who is insane appears insane, will act pardon the expression, they will act crazy in discordance with accepted normal behavior. This can be exploited, and it frequently is, by just flagrantly lying. The more we cling to objective reality, the more susceptible we are to its subversion. Uh, for example, Gregor McGregor was a broke Scottish, Scottish aristocrat. He faked and charmed his way through the military in Venezuela and ended up marrying Simon Bolivar's daughter and rubbed shoulders with, was it rubbed elbows, stood side by side with all of these aristocratic, high uppity up military people in uh, South America uh, associated with Simon Bolivar and uh, even to the point of marrying his daughter, totally deceptively. And then he abandoned the whole thing and he went to Panama. And he claimed that he owned a Caribbean island, the island of Poye, P-O-Y-A-I-S. So he returned to England and called himself Prince Gregor I. <laughs> this is in 1822. He began a media blitz. <clears throat> he claimed that this uh, island of Poye, Poye had beautiful crystal clear water, fertile soil, uh, riverbeds with gold chunks and gems just lying about, and a very subservient, pacified native population that would do anything. And he actually brought a native from somewhere with him. Uh, and he brought documents, a constitution, a land grant, a proclamation that's saying he was the prince. And uh, there's a book, The Sketch of the Mosquito Shore. And now mosquito doesn't mean the little buzzy insects, although that's where the buzzy insects got their name. It comes from the native mosquito tribe. And uh, this guy called Captain Strangeways, uh, Gregor McGregor, wrote this book called The Sketch of the Mosquito Shore, including the territory of Poye. So this was his evidence, you know, these documents, this native who couldn't speak anything other than the native language, so you couldn't question him. Uh, he claimed it had endless summers, a triannual harvest, 
It was a land of plenty with resources, both growing and mineral, that uh, there was fruit all year long. And uh, <laughs> that there was a, a full Western city called St. Joseph that had a complete infrastructure. It had paved roads, huge buildings, a church, a library, schools, a university that it had a deep water port, that fortunes were just waiting to be made, land was lying unclaimed because the natives just sort of sat around and did nothing. That the natives, um, that there, there were enough of them to work the land for any white person who bought the land. And they did staff the civil service and the military in this town of St. Joseph, but they didn't really own land. It wasn't part of their culture and that they would welcome colonists. So this is the story that this guy told. He had all the cognitive biases that uh, were hardwired, the limitations in our thought processes, the honesty bias. We believe what we're told in the absence of contradictions. So if somebody says, what time is it? And you say, well, it's, uh, I don't know, what is it? One o'clock, two o'clock? It looks like one o'clock, two o'clock. If it's pitch dark outside and they don't say AM, uh, you're gonna start questioning. But if your evidence agrees with what you're being told, you're gonna accept it without question. So these biases exist to help us process information more efficiently. Otherwise, we'd constantly be stopping and checking and stopping and checking. And you know, that's, you can't do that. So uh, m you assume that the vast majority of information that you're constantly receiving is the truth. You're not having to question every single thing. And that's good because otherwise you wouldn't be able to learn, you wouldn't be able to function, everything would come to a screeching halt. The honesty bias informs our shared expectations and judgment. And in 1822, interestingly enough, India, Australia, South America were real. Their discoveries and their colonization were real for these white Westerners. So why not another country called Poye? So, Europeans had gone and and colonized places, colonized, colonized places, and become wealthy. Come back with stories, brought gold back, the gold of the Incas, that kind of thing. So the upper crust was very upset at the time that they'd lost the U.S. colony. So they were even more inclined to embrace the notion of a new place to colonize, another opportunity. The lower classes followed the belief of the upper classes. Here, once again, we have a bias called authority bias. We're wired to believe our betters. I don't believe anybody. <laughs> so we're wired, if somebody of authority, like the CDC comes out and says something, I know it's kind of a shaky, shaky example right now because there's so much doubt being nurtured. But if somebody like the director of the CDC comes out and makes a definitive statement, you're more inclined to believe that person because they're authority. 65% of the population will always cede power to authority. You're more likely to believe any authority at all, even if their authority has nothing to do with the matter at hand, which is why you're more likely to believe that you're sick if a doctor tells you you're sick and not if a friend does. So if your friend says, you know, you don't look like you feel well, you're likely to brush it off. If a doctor tells you you don't look like you feel well, you'll believe it, even if it's a doctor of, I don't know, philosophy instead of medicine. And you're more likely to believe that you need a new car transmission if a doctor tells you than if a friend tells you. <laughs> and celebrities, this is why they hire celebrities to advertise things that they really know nothing about. Celebrities like Tom Selleck selling uh, reverse mortgages, perfect example. People will automatically trust him because he has a voice of authority. And uh, because their brains were working and uh, the nobility was saying it, then the lower classes were believing it. And McGregor wanted investments to develop Poye, so he did a publicity tour and people flocked to his speeches and were pushing each other aside to buy land. London had, uh, the London Lord Mayor had a banquet. Um, the King 
knighted him so that he could be sure that the Poye was an English colony. And it, it, there, it was easy for him after that to get a 200,000 pound loan and also to sell shares in land. He was passing out deeds. <laughs> and so it's one lie on top of another lie on top of another lie. He um, claimed that he had opened an office for the Poye legation. He opened land offices in many cities around Europe uh, to do business for Poye. He sold estates and plantations and farms and social and professional positions like you can be the um, the duke of whatever or you're the official in charge of blah 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 we'll make you secretary of state that kind of thing he uh, g sold government posts and military commissions he also <laughs> he sold money he made he forged currency called it poye money took English money in exchange because he said your English money will be no good there. And uh, since the English money was useless, he was able to sell and create a bond price for his currency of four, what would today be $4.6 billion. And then finally, he collected seven, seven huge ships of colonists to go to Poye. So the first ship got to Poye there was no Poye. It was an uninhabited, mosquito-ridden hot swamp. Most of the people that got there died of starvation and exposure and tropical diseases. Nothing would grow. There wasn't fresh water. There was nothing but uh, uh, malarial swamps, bugs, snakes. Not a good place. And a small surviving group of this first shipload was rescued by a passing ship went back to England and told everyone there was no Poye, it did not exist. Well, you would say that it was crazy to make up a country and have people believe you. So you'd, you'd be inclined to believe that Poye did exist. This big lie, it doesn't have to really be convincing. The bigger and more absurd it is, the more likely it will reinforce your basic instinct towards the honesty bias and to the big lie bias that nobody would lie about something so preposterous. And what's really interesting is when they came back and said, well, there is no Poye and we all died, they wouldn't believe them. They believed you guys made a mistake. You navigated incorrectly. You landed in the wrong place. Surely you're not telling the truth. So the theory of mind is the ability of an individual to know that he or she has thoughts or feelings or perceptions or beliefs, and so do other people. So the theory of mind is just this agreement that we have, that I have a mind, you have a mind, all God's children have a mind. You know? And you're being able to think about what somebody else is thinking about, that we're seeing, talking, speaking, and understanding the same thing, that we have this agreement. For example, you're a park, you're in a park and you see a stone wall and naturally you assume that anyone else in the vicinity can also see the stone wall. And you make many other assumptions, for instance, that it is a wall, that the wall is inanimate, that it's basically solid, you could not walk through it, it's largely immobile. None of this is remarkable. What is remarkable is that you assume, you absolutely believe that everyone else who sees the wall automatically assumes all these same facts and accepts these facts as objectively true. This is active engagement of theory of mind. My thinking about what you see or believe or know about the same wall, and it's referred to as mentalizing, a capacity that includes the critical ability to make inferences about the intentions of other people and their beliefs, and to infer whether the emotions or other states signaled by social cues are or are not an accurate reflection of the actual emotional state of the individual. In other words, to consider where whether others might be lying to us. It allows us to think about what another person might think, know, assume, or feel. So, uh, it gives us a commonality. And this is mentalizing, it's making inferences, it helps us to tell, are they lying? And it helps us 
to lie because you believe that people are thinking the same way that you are. That's a mistake. By lying, the big lie works by preying on our anticipation of a swindle that no one would lie like that. You might be swindled, but not that big. And uh, we are born with this. It's an adaptive evolutionary uh, survival mechanism. By 18 months, toddlers engage in deception. Like they'll hide food from you. They'll sneak candy, that kind of thing. They'll fake cry to get your emotions. If they can't do that, there's probably something wrong with their development. Uh, if the child's incapable of lying by the age of three or four, something is wrong. 1925, Count Victor Lustig, uh, Count <laughs> Victor Lustig, sold the Eiffel Tower to scrap metal dealers. And uh, again, he, a week later, he sold it to a different scrap metal dealer. He took their money, fled town. In 1901, William McCloundry sold the Brooklyn Bridge and spent <laughs> two and a half years in Sing Sing. And it was really a pretty funny story because uh, the police uh, would come and people would have set up uh, toll booths at the bridge and the police would say, what are you doing? And people would say, well, I bought the Brooklyn Bridge and I'm charging a toll to cross the bridge. And they'd say, get out of here. You can't buy the Brooklyn Bridge. You've been had. In 1883, uh, Brad, I can't read my writing. I believe it's Brad, but whatever, Mr. Mr. Seawaddle sold uh, the unfinished Brooklyn Bridge multiple times over a 20-year period. Fred and Charles Gondorf sold the bridge, removed the sign uh, every time the cops went by and for sale sign. <laughs> the cops would go by, they'd take the sign away, and they once sold half of the bridge <laughs> for $250. This just cracks me up. In 1925, Lustig, the guy who uh, originally sold the Eiffel Tower, he fled Paris for New York City. And uh, a guy called George C. Parker was then in the process of selling the Brooklyn Bridge. And the cops were constantly getting people to move along. You can't charge, you know, for, for uh, owning the bridge. Parker... Parker decided okay and he sold the Statue of Liberty and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Grant's tomb. He sold the bridge so often it's because of him that we say if you believe that I've got a bridge to sell you. That's where that comes from. Jefferson Randolph Smith 1898 was uh, this, is, this is the best story. He set up the first telegraph office in Skagway, Alaska. So what was happening? the Alaskan gold rush. It cost $5 to send a telegram. Now there were no telephones. Telegrams were the way that you communicated long distance. Uh, there were long lines around the block. Tons of people always waiting outside the office. Uh, the only problem is that the first telegraph lines were not uh, strung up in Alaska until 1900, two years later. So you'd go into the office and there'd be a guy clicking away at a desk and you'd look and you'd see wires going into the wall, but that's where they stopped. There was no telegraph collection in Skagway, Alaska, but he took messages all day long from people and he also uh, had them prepay for responses. He also had them give him money to wire home. So uh, the honesty bias here is exploitable and indispensable. Margaret Atwood, storytelling a very old human skill is her opinion that gives us an evolutionary advantage that it's collective intelligence and that, for example, people early on were told, hey, be careful over there, there are crocodiles. And people would tend to believe that, but if you, wanted to keep people away from a place, you would say, don't go over there, there are crocodiles. People learned to use it to their advantage. It was an evolutionary advantage and became a dishonesty advantage. 
Then there's this thing called confirmation bias. I think people are somewhat familiar with that. That happens on Facebook. Facebook exploits this. Uh, it's selective perception. Once you decide something is true, you see evidence to support your belief everywhere. I have a perfect example. I think women can relate to this. When you're pregnant, everybody's pregnant. It's the, it's the strangest thing. I don't think I've seen a pregnant woman. Well, times are odd right now anyway, and you don't see much of anybody. But I haven't seen a pregnant woman in ages and ages. When I was pregnant, everybody I saw was pregnant. <laughs> That's confirmation bias. Uh, honesty bias and confirmation bias protects us against cognitive dissonance. We can't hold two conflicting truths in our mind. We just can't do it. it it's, it's crazy making. And uh, you end up dumping one and keep the one that you need to believe is true. And this is why people deny the proof of climate change um, or won't believe the videos they see of crimes uh, unfolding. They can't believe it's true, so they just reject it. The big lie relies on your, not Trump's big lie, the big lie telling a big lie, relies on your theory of mind that people think the same way, perceive the same way, and share a faith in objective reality. Cons call it selling thin air. And uh, if something is too good to be true, it is. It's not true. When the colonists uh, at, from Poye returned to England, they defended McGregor. They would not believe that he had lied. They said there was a mis mistake in the ship route, that he was sabotaged, that something had happened to this colony of Poye while they were gone, before they got there, because cognitive dissonance makes, made them continue to believe this lie. McGregor fled to Paris and did bigger scams for more money and got away with them. So when we transgress deliberately and are not held to account, we tend to do it again and again, often on a larger scale. Donald Trump. This would be an excellent argument for why accountability matters. So what's on this page that I felt was important? We repeat behavior because we have once tested the water of other people's perceptions and we've emerged unscathed. We've learned a most dangerous truth that we can. We can get away with it. So this guy, McGregor, learned that people would believe him even with absolutely no evidence, and many would still believe him even with evidence that he was lying, and the more deep the buy into the lie, the more stubborn people clung to it. So if you were one of the people that sold everything, got on a boat, and went to Poye, you were even more deeply invested in believing his lie. He got caught when French officials began to investigate uh, so many people leaving the country with money. <laughs> and he got arrested, and then he was set free, and he went to England, and he did it again. So our belief in truth and the success of a lie are closely bound together. So I think I'm going to stop because we're on a new chapter here, starting a new chapter. I'll stop and upload this and give you guys a little taste of what's to come. So this is the end of part one, and part two will be on its way very soon. And after you watch this video, if you have questions for the cards, be sure to post them under the comments and try if you can remember to make the lettering capitalized because it'll catch my eye. And I won't see it until after I start uploading part two. So be patient. I won't be referring to anything that you put in the comments until after part two because I won't see it. So thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying this. These stories are hilarious. Unless you're on the boat to Poye. <laughs> so thank you and uh, Slung to Foil.